Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Okay, so welcome to the Functional Medicine Discussion Group meeting tonight. And the topic is the interplay of SIBO, fungal overgrowth, food allergies, and mast cell activation. That's a mouthful with Dr. Sam Rabarth. I'm Dr. Ben Weitz, and I'll make some introductory remarks before introducing our sponsors, and then I'll introduce our speaker for this evening. And I'm pleased that our sponsors for this evening are Integrative Therapeutics and Vibrant America Lab. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Schneider, uh, Steve Schneider from Integrative <laughs> Therapeutics uh, to tell us a little bit about some of the integrative products, Steve. That's cool, thanks. I just got a doctorate, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys, if you haven't seen or heard Dr. Abar before, you're in for a treat. Uh, we work with him, can I say that? pretty pretty extensively for a long time and um he's Thank great you. uh and this is kind of right up our alley we we have one really really important product for this that i want to i see a lot of people who already know this on the attendees but um our physician's elemental diet is a medical food for um severe moderate to severe gut dysfunction and it was formulated based on the research that dr mark pimentel did using the product Vivanex in, um, with elemental diets and SIBO. Uh, that research is pretty impressive um, for this treatment. And although if anybody's ever tasted Vivanex, it's the most gross thing ever. So they, they asked us to try and make something that was a little better tasting, um, that was hypoallergenic and kind of a more functional medicine appropriate product. Um, so, we have protocols, we have samples, we have discounts for patients that can't afford the treatment. We have tons of support for this product. Um, and it's something that we think is really important and really powerful. Uh, so we want to make sure people are well armed to, to get the positive results that this can yield. So um, if anybody has any questions about it or anything, reach out to me. I, I know several of you know about it. Um, the research continues on it. It's it's really the only real elemental diet out there um, aside from Vivanex. So there's a few trying to uh, pretenders out there. Um, but if you really look at the labels on those, it's not it's not really what what it's supposed to be. So um, without any further delay, Dr. Well, actually, actually, you know what, Steve, for, for those of us who might be listening to this uh, recording afterwards who are not functional medicine practitioners, maybe you could just tell us uh, briefly what, what, is, what is the benefits of uh, elemental diet? Exactly what is it accomplishing? Well, so it, it has, there's different ways to use it, but in the context of SIBO, the, the main two things you're doing are your you're providing complete gut rest. So you're providing all of the nutrition a person needs in elemental form. So it's easily assimilated. There's no work of digestion necessary. Um, and it's all absorbed upper in the upper GI. So it doesn't get down there to feed the displaced bugs, which is the other reason that it's good is because it's starving those bugs. So in the Pimentel research, it was about 80% negative breath tests after two weeks of the elemental diet. And the people who were still positive, they did another week and it had, um, it ended up being about 85% breath test negative. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the antibiotics and antimicrobials are one way to, to attack this problem. And the elemental diet is a different way. Um, so especially for people who've had a lot of, um, you know, been through a lot of courses, of antibiotics and stuff and, and want to try something different, this is a great option. So yeah, essentially you're starving the bacteria. Correct. And, and also giving the gut a chance to sort of reboot. So um, in, in other uses, you don't have to do a whole two weeks necessarily. You can get pretty good effects with just even a three day treatment. Um, but the research in SIBO is at two to three weeks. 
and you guys have a a, a dextrose free and um, a dextrose one. Yeah, well. there was a the original one was dextrose. It was um was we did that because we wanted it to be a little different than Vivanex, which is dextrose free. Uh, it works great. It's very sweet. Um, so we came out with the dextrose free one. We jiggered a little bit with the percentages of of fats and carbohydrates and protein equivalent. Um, so it's a little less sweet and some people prefer that one better. Um, it's all a matter of taste really. And that's why we have the samples. Great, thanks Steve. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks to Integrative Therapeutics. Um, so the, um, the vibrant person's not here but um, they're also co-sponsoring this evening. And um, so, if you're not aware of Vibrant America, they're a awesome functional medicine lab testing company. And it's pretty much a one-stop shop. There's not much they don't offer. They have all sorts of great gut testing. They have a great stool test. They offer um, uh, you know, a great um, uh, food sensitivity testing. Uh, they have... Um, hormones, um, everything that you could possibly want to get, um, for they, they have, um, great toxin testing. They offer, um, excellent testing for Lyme disease. So, um, it's, it's a great go-to lab. Um, it doesn't go through insurance, uh, and their prices are, are very, very, uh, awesome for cash prices. Um, so, consider Vibrant America and thanks to Vibrant for sponsoring this evening. Um, so our speaker for this evening is Dr. Farshid Sam Rabar, and he's the founder and medical director of Los Angeles Gastroenterology and Nutrition in Century City. Dr. Rabar is one of the few integrative gastroenterologists in the country, and he performs endoscopy, colonoscopy, like traditional GI doctors, but he also incorporates anti-aging and functional medicine for a truly integrative, holistic approach to digestive care. Dr. Rabar, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, uh, Ben, for inviting me. Uh, I must say it was a little bit of a short notice. I know the speaker uh, did not show up uh, or canceled, uh, uh, but I was able to put this uh, talk together in a busy schedule. Uh, I apologize, I don't have slides, but I put my thought process uh, and the message delivery on uh, uh, Dropbox uh, paper, which uh, I can send the link to uh, Ben and uh, he can put it on the website. Uh, if everybody's ready, I'll uh, proceed. I did uh, modify the title a little bit. Uh, uh, originally, Ben and I spoke about the interplay of SIBO, fungal overgrowth, food allergies, mast cell activation, and then I added the syndrome of food uh, FODMAP intolerance. We're seeing more and more people becoming intolerant to FODMAPs. And, uh, you know, my recollection is that this thing wasn't there before. Why we're seeing more of this now uh, coming that we are becoming intolerant to the small molecules there. So, uh, and the word interplay, interplay, it really refers to a dance of these elements in the intestinal uh, lumen of all these elements, uh, the part of the microbiome. And kind of, uh, it appears to me that as practitioners, we inter, we try to interfere uh, by trying to optimize this relationship of the microbes in the gut. So our role would be more of a choreographer to see if we can have them play correctly. Um, now, my uh, goals for this presentation are appreciation of the connection of the chain of events that lead to immune dysregulation and uh, addressing the trans, uh, a trans kingdom playground of, again, bacteria, fungi, and how do these things communicate with each other? The role of fungi in promoting bacterial persistence by mechanical disruption of the mucosal integrity, the unappreciated role of fungi in creating an anaerobic environment and promoting methane producing archaea, the role of fungi in supporting uh, 
C. difficile infection, and appreciation of the mucus barrier in intestinal barrier disruption, the so-called the leaky gut, and the immediate and delayed food allergies and sensitivities. Digging deeper to potential causes of dysbiosis persistence, environmental factors, stealth infections, mold, toxins, and exposure to environmental chemicals, another interplay of elements. And then I put some references uh, here, and I encourage you to read these references. This is not something you see in traditional textbooks. And these concepts are probably about 10 years out before standard academic centers would start to incorporate these, in my opinion. Intestinal microbiota in health and disease from a disrupted equilibrium to clinical opportunities. This is from a, a immunology in 2019. To be or not be a pathogen, candida albicans and celiac disease. And we will come back and look at this picture here. This is really out of this world, the way this was drawn and we see the significance of that. The role of fungi in C. difficile infection and unappreci underappreciated trans kingdom interaction. And again, a reference here. And article on intestinal mucus barrier, the missing piece of the puzzle in food allergy. Okay. And this is uh, in Journal of, uh, I guess I forgot to put the link for, the, uh, um, uh, for this article, but uh, this was published in 2021. It's really a basic science article, but uh, it significantly talks about the role of mucus, which I'm going to touch base on that. And just a comment about alkaline phosphatase, intestinal alkaline phosphatase is different than the bone alkaline phosphatase and uh, the one from the liver, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which is zinc dependent as a cofactor. And there are good quality zincs, particularly zinc carnosine, available to support this enzyme, which has uh, antibacterial and antifungal properties to keep the gut clean. And here is a reference uh, to the talks about immunity and microbes and alkaline phosphatase. Now, before we proceed and to be able to appreciate these concepts and these goals that I've created, uh, I thought I'd present to you in the 30 minutes that I have to do this presentation, the, um, 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 some case examples and see if I can uh, stimulate the mindset of the audience uh, uh, to see if we can say, okay, let's go back to the literature. One other reference I did not add here, it is my personal experience. We are observers, and uh, at one point we start to appreciate what we observe. We have hundreds of patients who have similar pattern. I don't believe I always need another article to come out in 10 to 20 years from now when you have hundreds of a similar pattern coming out. So at least in our practice, which I think is quite unique in the type of patients we encounter, uh, there seems to be what I call a pattern recognition, a pattern that is recurrent. Uh, and that has prompted us to come back and see what is out there, put these references out there for you. But these references, they support our own personal experience. Okay. Now, in these case examples, okay, I'm going to go with this first one, and this relates to elemental diet uh, that Steve was just pointing out. And uh, if you ever heard my talk from 2019 at the CIBO conference, uh, at that time I presented uh, the uh, pattern that we see with SIBO, and generally there are about 10 different patterns that we see. I think uh, uh, ben, you were there in that conference, uh, and I think that uh, yeah. kind of a, um, classification appeared to be appealing just to be able to memorize these type of SIBOs that we see based on the clinical response. This first case, I call it a paradoxical clinical outcome. Young female with history of methane SIBO previously responded well to zyfaxan and neomycin, and at times to fluconazole and nystatin with good results. This by itself tells us that the microbiome goes through a dance. I call it the dance of the microbiome. Sometimes it becomes more bacterial predominant and sometimes it becomes more fungal predominant. 
And at times it's difficult to know which one is the player. You have to do a therapeutic trial. In this particular instance, when we went back and forth, uh, we got to point that the patient was having some bloating and SIBO symptoms and a SIBO test showing a hydrogen predominant SIBO. At that time, we decided to treat with elemental diet, but because of fear of fungus associated with the sugar, I incorporated nystatin and flucolazole, both of them concurrently with the elemental diet. Now, why did you decide to include both of those? Because of the experience I had with the patient and the testing results previously, that uh, fungus at times was player and she had clearly responded to these two previously. So I said, look, there's a little bit of a carbohydrate in the elemental diet, and I don't want this thing to take over. Three days after the elemental diet, patient complained of severe abdominal bloating. What do you do? Now, it is not usual to hear anybody saying, I got bloated on elemental diet. Indeed, in 40 years of practice and 20 years of doing this, I've never heard of that scenario before. But I'd like you to think about it for a moment, and then we can come back and say, you know, what to do. Unfortunately, this is not a completely interactive, uh, you know, dialogue, you know, with audience, but... Uh, what do you do? Patient is already on fluconazole. Patient is already on high dose nystatin, 3 million units a day, compounded and pure. And the uh, abdomen is bloated on the elemental diet. What do you do at this time? So just to make a long story short, okay, what we did, we had to stop everything. And uh, by, by the way, what kind of testing had you done for this patient? He, he, she had a SIBO breath test. Had she had other testing? She had a SIBO breath test showing that the SIBO was uh, there, but it wasn't very severe. We didn't know if it's a fungus or bacteria, but there was still some element. Uh, generally speaking, when people go on elemental diet, there's usually no bloating because you don't really have any substance there and people get flat and comfortable. This was very, very unusual to feel bloated. Anyhow, what we did- uh Oh, I stopped... somebody asked why, why, why uh, compounded nystatin versus conventional? Well, I don't like the ingredients of the generic uh, uh, nystatin. If you look at it, the tablet is sugar coated and it has, they cannot guarantee that there's no wheat or gluten or corn products in it. For somebody who is so sensitive to many things with this type of case complexity, I don't usually use uh, uh, you know, the standard tablets. Uh, just ask your pharmacy to give you the excipients and other ingredients on the tablet. You will see what you get as a report. It's quite impressive. Um, anyhow, um, what we did in this case, uh, uh, we stopped everything. I speculated that uh, the, the clinical picture is one of fungi. And I also speculated that the fungi was resistant to nystatin and fluconazole because we had used it before. And what we did, we changed the, uh, um, uh, we changed the treatment to itraconazole, okay? And uh, within a few days, the abdomen became flat and the patient reported that she has never felt this good ever. And uh, we know uh, the previous workup had revealed that there was evidence of mold exposure uh, from maybe a residence that the person might have been in, and that might have been a trigger factor in the background, allowing fungal predominance here. Now, please stay with the thought. There's a lot to cover some of these concepts. You know, most of us have heard of all of these SIBO, C4 allergies, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is how these things, they interact. In this particular instance, you just notice how a fungus can suddenly become the predominant picture. It was probably there to begin with for a long time, and then suddenly it took over under the uh, SIBO treatment. The next case was a case of a young female with, I call it the mega gas, mega methane or mega meth pattern with a peak of methane over uh, uh, 100. Patient was treated with Zyfax and neomycin with good response, went over for a second course and a breath test uh, that shows uh, improvement by 80%. 
and patient says, well, I want to do a third round, and this is the classical treatment pattern that, uh, you know, it has been done outside. After the third course, the patient felt worse, and the breast the breath test was terribly abnormal. It was worse than the first one. So suddenly, after two rounds of neomycin and zyfaxan that had given patients significant improvement, suddenly she got a very bad methane. We're back to square one. What do you want to do? So, uh, Sam, how often do you end up prescribing two or three courses of zyfaxin? Well, I used to do this more uh, often. This case is from a few years ago. Okay. Nowadays, I do take a little bit more precaution because of my understanding of how uh, fungi might be a player into this. So please allow me to go through this. You will see I'm trying to make a point from this presentation. In this case, uh, I speculated, uh, this is back about 2019, that uh, the patient had a reason for immune dysregulation, allowing the uh, archaea to produce methane. And uh, when we checked the patient for tick-borne diseases, Babesia duncani came back clearly positive. So the patient was treated with malaron for six weeks, no other antibiotics, six weeks of malaron. After two months, she walked into the office. I said, I feel good. I just want to repeat my breath test. We did the breath test. The breath test was completely normal, completely. We did not use any more treatment for SIBO. It was obvious that the treatment of the underlying problem might have altered the immune system in a way to allow clearance of this type of archaea. And so the response was very remarkable. She even came back a few months later did the same test again, it was consistent. It looks like the problem was addressed. The Babesia test later on turned to be negative. It was done through hygienic sale. Uh, another uh, case is uh, in case what we call incongruent pattern. Patient presented with very high hydrogen pattern, recurrent pattern of SIBO. You keep treating, response, but it keeps coming back. Eventually, okay, um, we did, you know, we did some sort of urine organic acids, uh, and the markers for fungal dysbiosis uh, uh, were high. And uh, I speculated that the fungi might be in the background, leading to surface disruption and allowing crevices and cracks in the wall for the bacteria to uh, uh, to persist in the mucosal layer. I'm sorry, what is it? I, I, I think he just wasn't muted. Somebody just came into the room. Sorry. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so how do you manage a case like this? Uh, so in this instance, what we did, we stopped focusing on the SIBO and we focused on the managing the fungi. The question was that why a patient would have persistent uh, fungal scenario and when we checked, uh, there was evidence of environmental toxins, BPA and glyphosate and some mycotoxins. It was hard to say which one is the player. I basically treated the, the patient with a variety of binders for several months and concurrent antifungal therapy. And eventually we went back and treated the SIBO and the SIBO this time cleared. And it appeared that it stayed under control. The patient felt better and eventually decided to pursue pregnancy. So these three cases, they could be, uh, you know, I presume other physicians will see, you know, difficult patterns to control. And, uh, uh, and I think it is good to keep these in mind. So based on these presentations, I wanna come back and uh, show you one of the pictures we clearly refer to is this one here. In this case, if you, this is published in an article looking at some of the patients with uh, celiac disease that they may still have symptoms and they're gluten free, that you may be dealing with a, with a scenario of celiac. However, I use this slide as an example to show that if the mucus layer 
is disrupted, if the epithelial, the enterocytes are dis dis disrupted, you can allow, or one can allow the fungi to change shape from yeast format to hyphae. And these hyphae, they can have, you know, arms and legs. This is like an Eiffel Tower. This is like a jackhammer. And they can actually crack the wall and, uh, you know, uh, affect the tight junctions. This will cause aggravation of the mucus layer. I'm sorry, the mucus layer and uh, aggra aggravation of the mast cells and release of histamine and other inflammatory uh, chemicals. This will lead to patients sometimes showing up with allergies, nasal congestion, seasonal allergies, and dermographism, mast cell activation. So whole chain of events can take place by doing this. However, if you do, you see evidence of mast cell activation, even by a Simple physical exam, looking at dermographism, it suggests that the masses are turned on. And in many cases, one must think of uh, this fungal element. I don't believe we have appreciated the fungal kingdom adequately. These are different than bacteria. Bacteria, they can stick together and could be subtle and they produce a little biofilm. This thing can actually mechanically disrupt the, the tissue. By mechanically disrupting the tissue, you can pr produce crevices and cracks, and that will allow bacteria to stay here. And I believe this is one of the reasons you see SIBO, SIBO, SIBO keep coming back because of the mechanical disruption. Okay. Now, we have seen at this in our practice many women with recurrent urinary tract infections, women with recurrent, you know, men or women with recurrent sinus infections. And every time you give antibiotics, you basically feed this, you know, creature again, and we basically fall into a vicious cycle or what I call like a domino effect, okay? So this pattern actually has been described with fungi and C. difficile. And I look for, once I understood this concept, I said, look, is it possible C. difficile that is recurrent might be doing the same thing? And when I searched, the article easily came up. This was published in 2019 and talks about this unappreciated feature. So it's not just about UTI and science that is C. difficile. So in our patients that we treat for C. difficile, I generally incorporate an antifungal program with it, both as far as the dietary and maybe adding nystatin to the regimen. This is not a standard of care written everywhere, but uh, considering these concepts, uh, you know, if I feel is appropriate, I make a clinical judgment and uh, I incorporate antifungal treatments in the treatment of C. difficile in the hopes of preventing that recurrent pattern, a spore formation and so forth. And again, my theory behind this would be that there's probably some disruption, mechanical disruption of the surface that uh, allows uh, the spores or the bacteria to hang around longer. And then after your first course of treatment, you end up with another one. Now you add immune uh, dysregulation, weakness and uh, uh, clinical picture of malnutrition to some of these cases that even feeds further to recurrent C. difficile. Uh, now, this particular article talks about intestinal mucus barrier, the missing piece in the puzzle uh, of food allergy. And so, uh, let me see if I have this actually. Uh, you see my screen? Uh, so, let me just put that here. Okay, so this is the article that uh, was published uh, and uh, it really nicely goes into the details of this, that we need to appreciate further the glycoprotein that uh, it creates the mucus layer of the gut. And there's a mucus layer 
uh, in the stomach, small bowel and colon. Um, and obviously the stomach has its own version of the mucous layer, small bowel has its own version and the colon has its own. Uh, there are two layers with this that they describe. One is tight and is attached to the very surface and there's a looser mucous layer with you know, from glycoproteins that is sitting on top of it. What these mucous layers do, they create a smooth and a sliding uh, layer. It's like uh, ice skating. These bacteria can float on them and through the gut movement, they can be pushed out. When the mucous layer is damaged, uh, then you're gonna have a rough surface and that creates for these additional opportunistic bacteria and fungi to further lodge into this. Now, the relationship of the mucus layer with the Akkermensia is very, very important because as you might know, Akkermensia that recently was uh, uh, avail became available as a probiotic uh, is Akkermensia mucinophilia. And the, this particular bacteria for most part is supposed to be a good bacteria because what it does it's a mucinophilia means it likes mucin. It eats off the mucin. And by doing this, if you have a thick mucin, it makes it kind of loosens it up. It almost keeps the mucin in good shape. In scenarios of fungus, uh, from what we have seen, and I'm sure many of your patients have shown you rope worms by passing thick mucus layers from the rectum means that they've mucus becomes very thick and abnormal and that makes it very easy for this thick biofilm to allow many bacteria and fungi to lodge in there. So presence of this uh, uh, presence of Akkermensia is very very important uh, to be able to keep a healthier year and uh, this article they do talk a little bit about the Akkermensia mucinophilia, a commensal bacterial member of the human and non-human gut microbiota and a mucin degrading specialist that has been associated in humans with both beneficial and harmful effects in multiple disorders. Obviously, if your mucus is thin and abnormal and this thing comes and eats the rest of the mucus, you're gonna have more problems. But in the setting of fungus, in my experience, if the acermensia is depleted, and many of your labs will show you if you have adequate acermensia or not, it might be beneficial to incorporate acromensia as part of your therapeutic protocol. Okay. Intestinal mucus layer. Uh, for, for those who don't know, there is a commercially available acromensia mucinophila product available from um, um, Pendulum Therapeutics. Right. You should invite them the next time to support this program. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, anyhow, um, a stomach produces this mucin 5AC, MUC5, I call it, and then the gut has the MUC2s. And again, each of these are two layers, and then they have sub-classification. It goes into a lot of biochemistry. And just for you to know that uh, amino acids are commonly used in this mucus production, threonine, uh, serine, and glutamine, uh, they're necessary for uh, production of this mucus layer and the glucose is attached to the protein by what they call O-glycosylation. It attaches itself to the oxygen uh, molecule and is a form of a glycated hemoglobin, a glycated protein basically that uh, is created here. Uh, so in addition, the protein backbone mucins O-glycosylation is an important feature of the uh, uh, that contributes to the elasticity of the mucus, thus promoting activity as a lubricant to help expel uh, particles and parasites. So now I gave a new language we don't hear is mechanical disruption of the surface. We previously we talked about leaky gut. Leaky gut could be, you know, uh, loss of those. Uh, tight junction, leaky gut could be loss of a cell, that it dropouts or extrusion, 
But now we should also think about leaky gut as mucus layer being damaged, either too thick or too thin, and this can happen. Now, this article talks about environmental chemicals, which is fascinating because many of the environmental chemicals, they work as a detergent, like a soap, and they can actually uh, damage the mucus layer. And I believe many of these syndromes that we're seeing that I call the syndrome of FODMAP intolerance is because of exposure to these environmental chemicals that are showing up in our uh, food chain and in the urine. As we speak, we're currently working with Vibrant Laboratory. We have already started a research project to look at digestive manifestations and other manifestations in patients with abnormal urine output having these type of chemicals. As you might already know, back in 2021, in January, we published digestive and non-digestive manifestations of patients with vector-borne disease. That was published in Journal of uh, uh, Patient-Centered uh, Reviews by University of Wisconsin and Aurora Health. And, uh, um, uh, and that is our article is already available online. Uh, our next focus is going to be looking at uh, uh, the correlation or the association of presenting symptoms, whether it's digestive or non-digestive, with uh, abnormal urine uh, chemicals, including toxins of mold, environmental chemicals that would be 36 of them would be studying, and metals in the urine. So we will see what the update would be in a year or so. Okay, so I'm going to close this uh, article here. Okay, and then going back to so that reference is also uh, available. I'm sure if you look it up, it's going to come up easy. It's a free online. And, I, and Sam, I just put a reference for your article in the sh in the show in the chat box. Um, can I can I ask you? Um, should we think of the mucus layer as crucial for both the health of the uh, intestinal? Uh, intestine and for, to allow the healthy bacteria to grow, but at times, can't it also become a biofilm to uh, protect the uh, problematic uh, organisms? Exactly. And I think uh, that's where we need more research to understand how do you delineate what is normal and what is abnormal and you know how much is too much. Uh, you know, uh, I can tell you that uh, there was an article published in traditional journal of gastroenterology describing biofilms, a phenomenon that I could never really understand that why when I do colonoscopy in the area of cecum, occasionally we see a layer of biofilm stained green, but it is so sticky that if I use high pressure water, I would still have difficulty getting it off. And then you have another patient that comes and the, uh, for colonoscopy and the colon is completely clean. The mucosa is shiny and I don't have such a biofilm. Anyway, somebody published this uh, uh, last couple of years. And then I realized that when I looked back in our patients who have this type of biofilm, the majority of them were patients with Lyme disease and other problem that they had received a variety of antibiotics that probably created a very dysbiotic flora as a consequence of ongoing antibiotic use. And now I hypothesize personally that persistence of this bacteria, it requires a rough surface that uh, most likely it is uh, fed or sustained by this uh, fungal you know, interaction. And that's what I call the interplay. And so when I see recurrent bacterial infections, either sinus, urinary tract, or even gut, then uh, we realize that this uh, uh, may have a fungal, you know, component under it. And I think that also has to be addressed. So that's one of the take home messages I try to emphasize. The other thing is- uh, uh, Sam, let me just stop you for a second. Uh, Guy Citrin asked, um, what products have you seen or utilized um, that ha 
have successfully helped to repair the mucosal barrier? Well, I use a variety of products, you know, for that, uh, but uh, this probably would be better to do it in a Q&A so I don't get, get disrupted in my thought process. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, just hang in there with me. I can tell you what we do and what's available out there, but uh, okay. and then we can go from there. There's another, uh, there's a few take-home messages that I'd like to cover. Another take-home message here is the correlation between methane, uh, between the methane and, uh, um, uh, and fungus. Now, for those of you that you treat, uh, um, that you treat um, uh, SIBO, uh, you know, the methane SIBO, it does not have the same character as the back hydrogen. Methane uh, generally is very low, less than three. They say if you get to methane level of 10 is abnormal, but I think even that might be too high. But to produce methane, you need archaea. Archaea are bugs that they don't like oxygen. They don't survive in an environment that is oxygen. On the other hand, fungi, they like oxygen. That's why if you put a piece of fruit outside for a few days, you're gonna see it becoming a little moldy outside. You can actually see it sometimes visibly. So based on this concept, I said, let me do a search and see how do they grow archaea or methane producing bugs in the laboratory. I found a nice article, it is not listed here, but is available online that you know, this was done by microbiologists, how to grow methano methanogens in laboratory. So I went to their methodology and they said, okay, this is your Petri dish and you put A, B, C, D like a kitchen. And they were putting a little fungi in it. Wow, why they put fungi into that? And partly because fungi can produce a nitrogen just like the way we make beer and nitrogen is gonna replace the hydrogen. So you create an anaerobic environment. I say, well, maybe the same phenomena is happening in the gut. Duodenum showing a high level of methane, like the case I just pre presented to you, that to present, uh, to have a high methane, it appears to me that you need to have fungi around. So we started to look at the fungal markers for our patients with high methane. Nearly 90% of patients with high methane, they had markers for fungi positive. Either the stool had fungal growth or the organic acid showed it or the antibody to fungi were showing up in the blood. There were reasons for us to believe that the fungus might have been a player. Obviously fungus scenario and fungus dysbiosis, it has no discussion currently in classical textbooks of medicine, unless it's invasive and you're in the intensive care unit having with fever and invasion, or you're dealing with oral thrush, esophageal candidiasis, or vaginal yeast, there is no discussion beyond these areas of the role of fungi. And I think it needs to be further researched. If you look at the references I've given you, the same language is used by the authors as how unappreciated this scenario could be. And because of its ability to uh, disrupt the microbiome, disrupt the mucus layer, disrupt the, the uh, uh, enterocyte layer, crack the wall and create a mechanical disruption that produce you know, uh, crevices for the bugs to grow. This is what I call cracks in the wall. And it may be another concept to keep in mind when we're trying to, to deal with this. So um, with that uh, uh, scenario, I can give you a summary of what I like to be the take home message and I'm happy to answer any questions, okay. So con I put your concepts to consider. Methane SIBO indicates possibility of underlying fungal dysbiosis. Recurrent C. diff may be facilitated by fungal dysbiosis surface disruption. That's something I put there as a possibility. Underlying fungal dysbiosis indicated possibility, indicate, sorry about that, indicate possibility of immune dysregulation directing in two directions, TH2 dominance and allergies, food sensitivities and or immune weakness 
allowing fungal persistence, as if you took steroids, you took chemotherapy or antibiotics. So it looks that's now you have a vicious cycle. Fungal persistence may increase the likelihood of bacterial infections, such as recurrent sinusitis, UTIs, and the need for antibiotics, hence a domino effect. Then. Immune weakness can originate from microbiome disruptors, particularly mold exposure and environmental chemical exposure, such as conditions. Such conditions may coexist with vector-borne diseases. Clinical experience and therapeutics trial are needed to understand as what might be the major player in symptom presentation. A vicious cycle may follow. More emphasis need to be placed on understanding lubricant, mucus layer, and ecology of fungal kingdom. That's the take home message. So I'm ready for any questions if you have. Okay, so one of the questions is, what's the best way to repair the mucus layer? Well, I mean, one of the first thing we do is that we understand if there's bacterial or fungal scenario, we need to identify that. I don't always start to mobilize toxins because if you bring them into the gut and the gut is dysbiotic, you know, you may actually make the dysbiosis worse. If I feel there's a fungal elements, I usually use antifungals. Then you need to think about what does the mucus layer needs to repair itself. Now, there are some elements that I use uh, routinely is glutamine for sure. And then there are other amino acids. I usually give an array of all amino acids. Uh, but again, some of the main ones that are part of the glycoprotein, like uh, theonine, uh, threonine, serine, and glutamine, you can find this in a product, for example, such as the megamucosa from the uh, um, uh, microbiome lab. I think it has some of those elements. Uh, uh, most of the time, what concerns me with uh, these blended products is the excipients that they put in their colors, sugars, stuff that they put. And I don't personally like those things. And so when I see those things, then I may start to use the elements individually as opposed to using it as a blend. The more blended the stuff you use, more chance patients may have a reaction and it would be hard to know what's going on. Uh, but amino acid replacement, uh, including glutamine, Omega-3s are very important. Omega-3 actually helps to promote the growth of acermensia, which as we said, is helps with the help keeping a healthy mucus layer to the best of our understanding. And I use, use a variety of high quality multivitamins, including the Bs to make sure that uh, those elements are there. And if the patient is going on a carbohydrate limited diet, I use short chain fatty acids, uh, and uh, butyrate as a replacement, so to make sure the enterocytes have adequate amount of energy available to them. I also include zinc carnosine, and uh, then we go from this uh, replacement phase into attack phase, and if necessary, I add some uh, microbiome disruptors such as interface or uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, lauric acid, loricidine, monolaurin, you know, as a, as a measure to help to uh, disrupt the microbiome. Uh, NAC is another one I use, uh, but again, sometimes I use a combination, sometimes I use one at a time to make sure the patient can tolerate it, and we go from there. Um, I think one of the issues with fungal overgrowth, candida, etc., is the difficulty in having a definitive test for it. So, for example, you know, there's no breath test for uh, for fungal overgrowth. Um, what do you what do you find is the best way to test for the um, presence of fungus? Well, the honest answer is that I first uh, use my clinical judgment, and in clinical judgment, we look for potential risk factors that allow that. I do remember one case that uh, I told the patient, "Look, uh, I really believe you have a." fungal clinical picture, you have taken antibiotics, you have been under stress, your cortisol is high and you were on birth control pills. But all the tests I did came back negative. And I just said, please, I want you to take a leap of faith and just do the antifungal treatment. I'm gonna put you on this uh, uh, regimen with nystatin and a dietary change. And she dramatically improved. 
So most of the time, you know, I think clinical judgment is important, but to support it and maybe put the patient's mind at ease, I use antifungal antibodies. Uh, Vibrant has a, a nice uh, expanded panel of uh, antifungal antibodies uh, and is more than what you can get from a Quest lab because they only do candida albicans uh, antibodies. Uh, the other one is that I uh, heavily rely on urine organic acids, the microbial organic acids, but we have numerous cases where the test for organic acid was normal and I could see fungal growth in the uh, stool. One example was today, a man with history of inflammatory bowel disease, two plus candida glabrata, which is a relatively you know, aggressive uh, fungi in the stool showing up, but the urine organic acids was negative, but the antibody test was also positive. So there were still, there was a still supportive evidence that this patient might be suffering from a clinical picture of yeast, if you will. Um, when it comes to treatment for a fungus, um, Number one, when do you use nystatin versus other antifungals? And then how long do you think it's safe to treat with nystatin? Well, I didn't know the answer until we kind of evolved into this. And I don't think you're gonna find literature on this one, but I've talked to other colleagues as well. We have patients now on antifungal regimen sometimes over a year. If I ask them to come off, they won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, they know that they're going to have a trouble. Now, why the immune system has a problem? My theory is the chemicals, especially exposure to mold toxins, especially if somebody has the HLA profile that Dr. Shoemaker had described that they're multi-susceptible or mold susceptible, they hold on to this. It is almost 100% guaranteed I'm going to see this pattern if somebody has persistent scenario that they're genetically they're susceptible to the mold and they may have a, a slower mechanism in getting rid of the, the toxins there. So um, um, going okay. back to, I think as for how long, you know, we have used it long. I just monitored the liver, the kidney function. And uh, I just looked at the, I have the patients follow up with me periodically to make sure we're not making a microbiome switch going to bacteria to fungi and the liver and kidney functions and blood count are normal. I mean, in our patient practice, I can tell you, I have not seen a single case of liver enzymes going up with diflucan. Now, having said that, it may be, I may be too naive or too inexperienced that I have not seen it. Maybe time eventually will show a case. Um, have not seen any problem with long-term use of nystatin. In one case, the creatinine went up a little bit, uh, uh, but uh, I was not sure if that was nystatin or not. I, anyhow, we stopped it and we changed it to something else. Okay. Um, if you do use long-term use of these medications, it's obviously appropriate to, uh, uh, to uh, monitor the labs. I know one thing for sure that dealing with the fungus, this is not a strep throat. You take a 10 day course of uh, you know, penicillin. And uh, this creature, uh, it has its own behavior. It is capable of penetrating his arms into the, into the uh, uh, mucosa. And that hyphae pattern, it, it may take uh, months to years to, to type to clear. What, what are the most effective natural products for antifungal? Um, I'm not gonna give you one single item because there's no research to use, uh, say, oh, this versus the other one. You have you know, garlic from berberine, from uh, oil of oregano, from podoarco, all these things have been studied. Uh, please bear in mind that when you use an herb, okay, which in my experience, the herbs are not as powerful in dealing with the antifungal with the, uh, with the fungus clinical picture, especially is if it's an advanced form. Now, I may be seeing a skewed you know, population in my practice, and many people may just get away by an herbal product. In our patient population, I cannot completely rely on herbs uh, as an antifungal. However, I use them, maybe more so for maintenance, maybe an adjunct. But I want to give you an example of a quick patient where 
a patient came and I saw evidence of fungi and SIBO, both of them. I said, look, I'm not sure which one to treat. Shall I treat your fungus first? Shall I treat? And she said, well, can you just give something to cover both? So I came up with a five herb program. I used five different herbs, okay, herbal products from uh, biotic research, from uh, um, uh, um, uh, ADP, dysbiocide, uh, uh, allicin, and uh, um, uh, this other one. Uh, anyhow, uh, uh, five of them we put together. And uh, within three days, patients said, look, I am more bloated on five different herbal products. I speculated that the herbs basically lowered the bacterial component more preferentially than the fungal component. I immediately stopped the herbs, put the patient on nystatin alone. Within a week, the bloating and discomfort subsided. So when you use herbs, herbs are good, but they're not a specific just for fungi. They're also for bacteria. And case by case may vary because we don't know to what preference they may actually suppress that particular kingdom, if you will. Are you with me on this one? It's very important to understand because yeah. you, can create, you can create a microbiome switch with this. And this type of language comes from having encountered patients with this scenario we had to deal with, but it's not something one would forget. Um, somebody asked a question about colon hydrotherapy. And what about it? Uh, is is that water? ever a, something you might use, say, with a patient with chronic constipation or? I do. I mean, if somebody has constipated, uh, we have sometimes recommended uh, coffee enemas. Uh, and uh, colon hydrotherapy, especially if they're constipated. And it may help to remove some of the uh, you know, thick microbiome and fungal elements, uh, but it's not gonna be adequate because you're not completely addressing the small bowel. So, you know, and I usually tell the patients, if you do it, how do you feel? If people say, I feel good, I feel refreshed, I feel energized, I say, okay, do it. Uh, you know, if it didn't make any difference, please don't do it. Uh, so what are the particular dietary factors that you think are most beneficial for patients with fungal uh, problems? Um, are you putting them on a, a low sugar carb approach like an anti-candida diet? Are you uh, avoiding things like mushrooms and other sources of, of fungus, uh, peanuts, et cetera? <laughs> Well, I definitely do not recommend peanuts <laughs> because especially they, you get the crushed ones. You don't know what they crushed in there. Okay, okay. Look, you know I'm not the one who does the dietary counseling directly. Okay, I give the principles, but people say, why shall I follow an antifungal diet? I said there are three reasons to follow an antifungal diet. You don't want to take the sugary stuff, either with this juice or fruits, or you know, or stuff like cookies or chocolate or ice cream that directly feeds the fungus. The second principle is that you wanna make sure that the product that you eat doesn't have ochratoxin or other mycotoxins in it. Because if you swallow it, you're gonna to add to the problem. And the third scenario is, uh, um, is you wanna make sure that that particular product is not actually a fermented product from yeast, such as uh, kimchi or sauerkraut or some of these things that are really more fungal fermented. We don't really know what it's going to do. I am not in favor completely in using uh, uh, espoulardi in this scenario. You gotta be very careful. If the patient has immune suppression, espoulardi can sometimes take over. And this is part of their actually, you know, their you know, precaution when you look at the, like the use of uh, this in patients with chemotherapy, Patients who have a line, you know, the, you know, the beneficial bug can become sometimes a pathogen. Now, having said that, uh, I've had many patients who say, "Look, I took Espoulardi, and I feel my fungal clinical picture is behaving better with me." I don't argue with them. If you tried it and it was beneficial, but if you try it, make sure the patient is not immune compromised because it could go other way for you. Kim. 
Now, medicinal mushrooms are commonly used in uh, many functional medicine practices uh, to strengthen the immune system for brain function. Should they be avoided while treating a patient for fungal overgrowth? Well, are you using a crushed mushroom or are you using an extract of mushroom? I don't uh, have a problem with an extract. Okay. 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 I don't have a problem. Like there are, you know, products that we use for that. These are T cell. They support the T cell function. Right. And if somebody actually has a TH2 dominance, it may be beneficial to use something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, to get mushroom and, you know, crush them and eat them that way, it's a little tricky. You know, you, you have to look at the clinical outcome. If they said, uh, you know, I, I gotta say, look, you gotta try it and see what happens. It's not something I'm gonna rush into recommending somebody. What, what are some of the most common symptoms that alert you to the idea that they might be having a fungal problem? Generally speaking, um, first of all, we see it more in female gender, okay? And I just think that, you know, I always say to my patient, it looks like a fungus loves women and it loves estrogen. And so anytime there's hormone, you know, um, replacement, particularly birth control, a stress, high cortisol, okay? It gives me clues that this could be the problem. Also ask your patients if they have had at least food or toenail fungus or they have dandruff. These may be almost telltales that there may be a fungal clinical picture going on in that scenario. Um, do you worry about resistance using uh, antifungals for so long? And I do, I do. That's why I just gave you that my first case was an example of that. We don't even have a way to check for that. I cannot see what is they're sensitive to or what they're, you gotta use a lot of clinical judgment in this. Okay. That case probably would have puzzled many people, you know, with the uh, uh, bloating on you, because I, I, I personally had never seen it before. You see, you know, most people say, oh, my stomach is flat. Okay. So this was quite unusual. I knew that we were dealing with a major fungal scenario as soon as I heard that. Uh, um, have you ever had your patients get a fecal microbial transplant? Is that a treatment option for some of these cases? Patients have done it on their own, you know, overall with some good success. Uh, uh, we obviously need more data on that. Uh, I actually made a trip to Taymont Clinic uh, in the UK. Uh, you know, with Dr. Erdman, we went to the uh, city of Letchworth uh, next to close to London. And, uh, you know, we looked at what, how they do. They use actually aggressive colon hydrotherapy to clean up the colon before they do FMT. I think part of it might be because they're trying to clear some of the, you know, thick biofilm that might be there. Um, so, um, you know, I think, there, you know, FMT has some role. It just, you know, we try to actually see if we create a protocol and, but when we got to the IRB, we got to stuck with them. They couldn't understand what we were doing. And then right after that COVID pandemic came in March of 2020 and, you know, $20,000 worth of uh, <laughs> trying to do IRB work <laughs> got wasted. <laughs> oh, bummer. Um, is, is there an issue using antifungals with patients with um, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Um, I don't know if there's an issue you need to monitor, but I certainly, in my practice, if I see evidence of that, I use it. Okay. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, like cases of pouchitis, you know, many cases of pouchitis, I may treat uh, uh, not only with uh, mesalamine to uh, block hydrogen sulfide. Um, I sometimes use Zyfaxan also in addition. But uh, if I see any fungal uh, scenarios, uh, uh, I add nystatin, preferably a compounded version that is pure to that. I don't, you know, comp they may be resistant, but we'll see. Today, indeed, as we speak today, uh, we did see one patient who came with history of uh, Crohn's and uh, history of uh, uh, pouchitis after, you know, uh, uh, colon was removed and basically an ileal pouch was made. But the question was that why there was pouchitis and pouch inflammation was driven by what? Now, obviously, uh, traditional medical model uses, uh, you know, uh, uh, TNF alpha blockers and 
uh, IL-23, uh, you know, blockers, uh, Stellara, to control, um, uh, to control uh, this type of inflammation, but I don't believe it really addresses what drives the fire. And uh, when we looked at these patients, most of these patients have exposure to mold or environmental toxins that has led to fungal overgrowth and it becomes a vicious cycle. You don't know what came first. However, to recover, it's conceivable to me to use uh, antifungals in this scenario. Most of the time I use nystatin and so far I have not had any problem with that, okay? However, you need to use clinical judgment and see, you know, if that would be appropriate for your patient. Now, we know candida can colonize all throughout the GI tract and in different parts of the body and other mucous membranes. Um, do you ever have to treat the nose or other areas? I mean, for patients who have nose uh, problems or congestion, I usually get a culture and see if you actually show fungus in that area. Many of them, they do have Marcon's. Uh, I personally don't use the um, antibiotic regimen for the Marcon's. I try to uh, uh, use uh, um, nasal irrigation um, and sometimes silver, uh, maybe sometimes uh, xylitol to make it uncomfortable for this bacteria or the biofilm to stay there. Uh, to get rid of the Marcon's is very difficult. And if you introduce antibiotics, and if the patient has a gut problem with fungus, any of that stuff gets into the gut, you can actually make the fungal dysbiosis worse. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, more um, conservative when it comes to nose treatments. Do patients who have fungal problems in the gut, do they also uh, tend to have fungus, fungus in their um, nails? It's a common question for me to ask. It's not a common occurrence, but it's a common question. I would say probably about one or two out of 10 patients will tell you they have toenail fungus. The fascinating part is this, that you will not believe it. Several of our patients where we only treated them with nystatin, which is non-absorbable, they reported to me that the toenail fungus completely cleared. I gave them nothing. But the two. So it's obvious that when you manage the immune system and you allow it to recover, it takes care of itself. Um, given the fact that a lot of these patients have compromised immune systems, besides treating the fungus, what are the most effective ways to treat the immune system? Um, that's a broad question, and I'm not sure if I can give you a quick answer to that. Okay. I mean, uh, it, let's say you get a stool test and they have a low secretory IgA. What well, that's not it? I mean, we're not talking about, you know, gamma globulin deficiency and other things. I mean, if I see, right. okay, many of your T cell, uh, you know, if you have a T cell uh, function that is low, like a CD57 low, one of your T, T markers are low, uh, you may have to use nutritional replacement. Some of this could be malnutrition. And uh, so by providing the nutrient replacements, uh, many times you can actually support the immune uh, system. Uh, if the immune globulin is low, then we just use uh, either colostrum or better the serum bovine uh, derived immunoglobulin, which is a favorite one, is part of the, uh, one of the proteins that we use for the leaky gut. And I think somebody asked that earlier, what do you do for that? This is also one of the things we add to it. Uh, You're talking about the SPI protect. Something like that. Something you know. like that. Yep. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, do you like BPC-157? Do you use peptides? I do. Uh, I you, you frequently use the BPC-157 as part of our leaky gut protocols. And what, what dosage do you use for that? Most common dose is the 500 microgram once a day because it's also a little bit pricey. Occasionally at, at first, especially if somebody has, let's say a lot of hives and rashes, I make for maybe two, three months, use two a day, like one, twice a day. Oh, and then in, in terms of the Nystat and the compounded Nystat, what is the dosage you're typically using? The maximum dose is usually 3 million units a day. 
in one case, the patient requested for me to go higher because she tried it on her own and said, look, I, I did better on 4 million units. It was actually a patient with celiac disease. And uh, I showed her the article that how the fungus can interact and she was having symptoms. So we went up to four, but unfortunately she was living in a moldy home and she couldn't get out. And that I believe continued to allow persistence of a fungal clinical scenario because the mycotoxins are immune suppressants like the mycophenolic acid, that's like cell sept that they use uh, you know, in chemotherapy and uh, in transplant medicine. So many of these are immune suppressants and they allow growth of micellar form of the fungi. So 4 million, you know, I have one case we went most of the time three and I usually start very slow, maybe at 500,000 once a day and just ask them to add maybe by one pill every five days to get to the maximum dose. Great. Um Awesome, Dr. Rabar. Thank you so much for an excellent, excellent presentation on a fascinating, complex topic. And uh, for those who want to find out, uh, who, who want to get a hold of you to contact you, um, where should they go? The, well, our website is probably the best place to uh, refer to the LAintegrativeGI.com. And our contact information and email is on the website. Great. Excellent. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you next month. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office, 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben White. Thank you and see you next week.